Good day. My name is Tony Ballinger, and this is the Fighting Men of Rhodesia series. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Ian Leo, who was not only in the Rhodesian Army, but was also in the Zimbabwean Army, um, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, um, and he had the title of Chief Accountant. Um, I've read his story um, offline before we started chatting, and um, it's really interesting. So I'm looking forward to you all hearing it. And uh, so over to you, Ian. Tell us about uh, your life before you entered the army and what happened thereafter. Yeah, t thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy to be here, to be honest with you. I've been a member of uh, FMR for a while now. And um, I normally look at the, the video recordings that uh, that, you, that you've actually um, you know, put onto YouTube. So thank you. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously born 1955, Durban, came up to Rhodesia when I was a couple of years old with my parents. And first of all, went to Amtali, went to Convent High in Amtali, then to Bulawayo. I met Bulawayo, I did my main schooling at Bulawayo, um, Christian Brothers College, St. Thomas Aquinas, and then ended up at Northley High School. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a good, it was a good experience in Bulawayo. Absolutely love Bulawayo. And um, it was a natural consequence that I ended up um, doing my national service at the Whelan Barracks. Um, so I went into, um, um, into and let me go back a bit. I um, I received my call of papers like everybody else did. I was 17 years old. Um, and um, yeah, there, there were, I think, about 10 or, 10 or 12 of us in our party that actually received call of papers. The call of papers that we received, were, in fact, were um, for nine months. Um, but whilst we were actually in, I say we because we went in as a group, whilst we were in, um, that changed to 12 months. So I went in on the 1st of March, 1973, did my, my basic training, training like everybody else. And then after that was posted up to Wanky and attached to uh, one independent company. What what uh, uh, year was that? You said it was 70... 1973. And the intake was? Intake 130. 130. Okay, carry on. Intake 130. Sorry, I meant to tell you that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so at, uh, um, ended up at one independent company. And then um, from there, we were deployed a hell of a long way. We had to go to uh, the Zambezi Valley, um, down the escarpment um, into that area. So for the better part of that that, that period after our, um, our initial training at Llewellyn Barracks, we ended up in the valley. Um when we when we when we finished our our national service, um, we were then um, transferred to one brigade, Brady Barracks, um, for our continuous call ups, our six weeks in, ten days out, ten days um, out, yeah, um, and that was in nineteen seventy four. Um, I think it was the twenty fourth of February nineteen seventy four. I still remember it because it was just short of the twelve month period. When we left one independent company, we came down in the troop train um, from Wanky to Bulawayo. Um, when we left Wanky, in fact, a brand new independent company arrived. It was four independent company. That was uh, probably me. <laughs> <laughs> what intake um, were you? I did four and one intake, uh, one in depth as well. Um, who was who was the commanding officer one day, one in depth when you were there? Um, you know what? I can't. I actually can't remember. I can only remember one person that was there, and he was a sergeant major Sheridan. Um, but I can't remember who the actual who the CEO was of that of, of one independent company. And but when and we left, did sorry. you you patrolled from sort of um, Kasangula to Vic Falls or east of Vic Falls? No, no, we, we traveled to to Zambezi to to uh, the escarpment in the Zambezi Valley. Yeah, so on the west was Kasangula on the Botswana border. Then there was Vic Falls. That that is correct. Going yeah. east east of Vic Falls, so you were west of Vic Falls, were you? Or um, east of Vic Falls, down in the valley there. No, it would have been west of Vic Falls. Vic yeah. Falls. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, towards, towards yeah. I doubt it was me because um, I arrived there. I was intake one five two, which um, arrived probably early, early or late seventy six actually. Yeah, so it was a bit after your time. Yeah, anyway, by then yeah, we, were, yeah. we were well into the the call ups by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. So as I said, when we left um. Wanky to come back to Bulawayo, um, poor independent company arrived. Yeah, brand spanking new. It, it it's a it's a time that I would never forget because when I say brand spanking new, they still had the plastic on their rifles. You know, it was incredible to to actually brand new vehicles, brand new 
uniforms, brand new, everything. Yeah. So anyway, so we came down on the troop train um, down to Bulawayo, um, and it, yeah, my, my my father picked picked us up in his in his uh, in his bucky, and I went across the road from the train station to Car Mart, and I bought a brand new Datsun 1200. You know, th these are the things that you remember going back for such a long time, but because it was my first vehicle, it was um, yeah, it was a brand new. I think it was like an orange Mustang colored um, uh, Datsun 1200. Um, after that, yeah, we were posted to one brigade, um, you know, the one brigade, and that's where we um, were allocated. We were, we were allocated to second battalion, two RR, and I was put into B company. And um, we started our, our call ups then. We got our call up papers for, for uh, the, um, you know, for the call ups six weeks in, 10 days out. And we operated mainly in the southeast area, which was Operation uh, Repulse, I think it was. Yeah, Repulse, yeah. Yeah, and we, we went from, basically from that, where we were based, we actually had a company headquarters at Ritenga, um, not far from Buffalo Range and Chiredzi Triangle, if you know the area quite well. Indeed, I do. Um, I was in 2RR as well, a company. So I seem to be following in your footprints so far. Sounds like it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we also also did a couple of tracking courses um, um, with Rod College. I don't know if you remember Lieutenant Rod College. Oh, no, I didn't meet him. No, we did, I did a couple of tracking courses with them. And um, we did those courses. In fact, if I remember correctly, somewhere near Tuli, Tuli Circle, uh, towards the Botswana border, it was, um, yeah, it was quite an experience. In fact, I remember the one occasion when we were walking with... Um, um, the guy that was taking us on the course, um, a black guy, I can't remember his name now. Really, really, really uh, um, a well-experienced tracker. And, you know, we would follow him and he would point out different things and say, look at the lie of the grass and, and that kind of things and the spore and, and everything else as well. And then he um, he said, you go first now, you, you give it a go. So I went from the front and off we went. At some point we were walking along and all, was, all I heard felt was his hand on my shoulder saying, stop, stop. So I stopped. I said, what's wrong? And I started me looking around, thinking maybe we're going into, into a contact or something like that. And in front of us was a huge black mamba. And this was laying in the grass, looking at us. And I'll never forget that sound. This snake growled. It didn't hiss or whatever. It growled. <laughs> and this guy said to me, just walk back very slowly. Walk back very slowly. And very aggressive we snakes. Yeah. yeah. So it was quite a, quite a scare. Anyway, so... Um, based at uh, um, at Tritenga, we we were deployed um, towards the Mozambique border and sometimes across the border um, between two rivers. And those two rivers, one was the Mandi and the other one was the Shepu oh. in, in Ghana Zoo. It was quite a quite an extensive operations. We did that. A couple of occasions, we were sent um, in to be uh, in support of and attached to RLI, and when they went into Mozambique and did whatever they needed to do. Um, the one op, in fact, was one, I can't even remember the op name. Um, it was to bomb the railway station in Malvernia. Oh. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, we obviously went through there and went through that night. And the engineers actually um, breached the minefield so we can get across the minefield into Mozambique. Um, yeah, I can remember that quite clearly. And, uh, you know, you know what, Tony, those days, we didn't fear anything. We were young, we were fit, we were well-armed, well-trained. We didn't we didn't fear a single thing. The only thing I feared personally was the game, the wild game. You know, the elephants and the lion and absolutely. And, and, yeah, it was it was that's all I feared. Um but uh, fact, we wanted to get we, we had one of our sergeants killed there by an elephant. Um it was Rob Hickey. Rob Hickey, yes. Yeah. He, he had had it, the elephant had had its the end of its uh, trunk blown off in a flower shed. Very angry animal. And uh, yeah, trampled into death. Um, not I remember that incident quite well, actually. Oh, did you? Oh, Shane, yeah. he, he was a nice guy. He was, I remember him. He spoke to his fiance the night before we went from Fort Vic down into the southeast there. And um, Shane, they had a bit of an argument on the telephone, and that was the last time he spoke to her. Oh, but uh, he was a very nice guy. I really liked him. And trust my neighbor to start cutting wood when you're talking. Um, mm -hmm. Can you expand a bit more on that attack on Marvinia? I can't, Tony. You know, I, I don't remember the full details. I remember that we 
we were in support of of um, RLI. There might have been other um, other units there, the scouts maybe. I don't really know. Um, I remember us walking and walking at night and going through that minefield. Um, and in fact, strange enough, I bumped into my brother. He's an engineer and he was standing there directing people, showing them where to go. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, I don't remember the actual operation itself. So I won't be able to comment on that. All I do remember was that we walked through a, um, a forest at night mm. and it was pitch black. And then there was a... Um, um, a herd of buffaloes that stampeded, and it was absolutely frightening. It really was. I can't remember a time that I was more scared than then. You know. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to say something? No, no. Was, it's it's amazing what you're saying. It's just so similar to my experiences as well. Up at Vic Falls, we uh, were doing an ambush, and I could have sworn it was about a thousand tears walking through our position. But as your eyes focused to the night and adapt to the night I thought it was a massive herd of buffalo and we were just lying behind a log and uh, it's not a nice feeling they are really nasty animals yeah the, the, the worst thing there was that um we didn't know where they were coming or going you know which way they're coming from which way they're going to and so we imagined they were coming through to us and uh, even though it was in a forest the trees were yeah i think everybody had a tree to themselves so there wasn't much room you know um yeah that was quite a quite an experience so we operated a lot in Gonera Zoo. We really did. And we operated down towards Whitebridge as well um, in a couple of those frozen areas. Yeah. Uh, and uh, our orders were to shoot anything, you know, whether it was animals or... or that's right. Yes, we had the same the same strategy um, to deny the tours any form of sustenance. And um, we were t told to shoot cattle or whatever we saw. In fact, we came across a lot of cattle that had belonged to kraals in the area. And, and you know, they were still coming back to get water at night and uh it, it was horrible we had to shoot them but i didn't enjoy it at all it was a miserable experience no, I, we, we had the same experience and there were a couple of donkeys and, and and goats and whatever around and yeah we just didn't want to do it it was you know i think even at that early stage it was an animal lover um, yeah. and i am now and uh that, that was unfortunately the, the 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 downside of the war mm. um but orders were orders after the after our, our 10 days r and r on the one on the one time this was probably sometime in 79 so all in all i try to work it out and um, all in all i did about six six years of um five years actually because it was one year in national service five years walking in the bush patrolling in the bush ambushing uh, stock groups you know being picked up by the choppers and dropped off and in, in, into stock groups and ambush positions etc ops you know plenty plenty plus and it was sometime in in 79 we were on r and r we came back um, and we, no, sorry, we had a retraining session um, and we were sent to um, a, a battle training ground in near Essexwell um, called High Acres. I didn't ever went there. So the whole the whole company was there um, at High Acres and we just completed the, the training uh, and we were just getting our ammunition and, and kit together for deployment the next day. And I went, I was a lance corporal then, a stick leader. I went to um, the guys and said, what do you carry? And I checked them all. They had HEs, they had rounds and whatever, rations, et cetera, the medical stuff. And I said to Kenny Robb, who was my MAG gunner, I said to him, we haven't got enough phosphorus. Go back to the trailer and go, go to the trailer and, and pull out a you know, phosphorus for all of us. And he started saying, oh, yeah, come on, man, I'm busy cleaning my gun. You know, you could call it a gun then because it was an MAG, <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a rifle. No. Um, yeah, as you know, so... Um, I said to him, okay, we'll stuff you, I'll go myself. So I went across the ammunition trail and there were quite a few guys hanging around there getting ammunition as well. And uh, cut long story short, I pulled out two grenades um, out of one of the, the, the crates and whatever, and the handles flew up the grenade. Mm. And I was absolutely shocked. And all I could say was, yeah, I, I just couldn't believe it. I just mm. remember that. And I got rid of one of them. I threw one of them in my right hand. And um, as I turned around to look for a place to throw the second one, because there were guys milling all over the place, it blew up in my hand. Hmm. Um, luckily, it was a, when I say luckily, from the positive side, it was a, a post grenade. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't an HE grenade. If it had been an HE, HE grenade, you know, I wouldn't be here now talking to you. And hmm. I don't think other guys around me would have been around either. Yeah. So. As I got rid of this thing, I tried to get rid of it, and the, the, the second one in my left hand, it blew up in my hand, and it just hit me, uh, hit me for a, a six. And um, I burst into flames. 
completely. I mean, I was just on fire. I got quite a shock, so I just took off. Just that was the first thing that came into my mind, my mind I guess. And I'm I'm relying also on reports from people that were there. And uh, I eventually got tackled by um, you may know him, Phil Nell. No, I've not met him. Yeah, he eventually tackled me, pulled me down. I rolled over to get the flames out. Um, he grabbed a bucket of water from the kitchen and a couple of blankets and whatever, and they doused the flames. Um, but as you know, phosphorus burns in oxygen, so it just carried on burning where you know when if it wasn't um, wasn't covered in any way. Yeah. So long story cut short, it had done quite a bit of damage by then. I got burned quite badly all over, burned all my hair off completely. Um, my whole hand had been blown open. The thumb was hanging by the skin. Um, and my, you know, the one finger looked like it had been put through a pencil sharpener. You know, it was just a thing on the end of it. So I had to be Kazavak. The, the medics came across and they did what they could, you know, pumped me full of morphine and stuff. So I didn't feel much pain. I didn't didn't uh, experience a lot of pain as, as far as I can remember at that time. And because the choppers were deployed on ops, I couldn't be Kazavak by chopper. So I, um, they grabbed a, one of the local farmers and he Kazavak me to Bulawayo Central on the back of the bucky. And all the way there, the medic had one of these saline drips. And every now and then it would just, flames would come up again. He would just uh, <laughs> douse them with the with saline drip. So, yeah, so I ended up in Bulawayo Central, went straight to ICU. They bandaged me up um, as best they could. And the orthopedic su surgeon came along and he said, look, you know, I'm going to take your hand off. And I thought, well, I've got to do what you've got to do, you know, at the end of the day. But fortunately, he managed to save my hand, and they amputated the thumb, which was almost gone anyway, and mm. part of my finger. So um, I didn't really miss them, to be honest with you, to this day. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I was lucky that I came out of that alive. Mm. Jeez. And then yeah. what happened after that? Well, after um, a fairly long time in, in Bulawa Central, um, it was uh, they moved from ICU to, uh, to Grey Ward. And uh, that's where a lot of other guys were, were also injured as well in the same ward. And you could actually see the, the chopper come in at the landing zone um, in front of the windows of that ward. So to an extent, it was quite depressing. But um, So after that, um, when I was discharged, I got a message from a lady in, uh, in Ministry of Defence. I can't remember her name now. And she said to me, um, we have a position available in Ministry of Defence. Are you interested in it? And um, not being employed at that time, I said, yeah, why not? So I went up for an interview to Ministry of Defence in Harare, uh, to Milton Buildings, and um, it was for an accounting clerk in the accounts office of Ministry of Defence. Um, I passed the interview and I started working there. Amazing. That was in 1979. Mm. Um, at that time, the senior accountant for Ministry of Defence was a guy by the name of Basil Barr, who's a very good friend of mine to this day. Um, he ran that office and his responsibility was for all the appropriation accounts for all the services. There was Ministry of Defence, there was Army, Air Force, um, Guard Force, SFAs. He he had to maintain the budget for all those all those um those departments. So it was quite a quite a big job. Obviously, there were descriptions of what was being purchased at that point. Did anything interesting cross your table that made you raise your eyebrows? Not really. There was a lot of classified stuff that obviously came through there, but I'll come to that now. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, as part of the as part of the employment um, that I, that I was in, then I had to undertake training. So I went to um, over a period of time. I did the accounting training at uh, the Public Services Centre, um, which was on Enterprise Road in Highlands in Salisbury. Um, so I did their modules there, and I, I qualified as a public accountant and accounting officer. And when Basil Barr eventually left in a couple, after a couple of years, I took over his position as senior accountant for Ministry of Defence. Um, I was also appointed, and this is where I'm coming to your point now, I was also appointed the accountant for the Defence Procurement Fund. This was a, a secret fund that they used to um, pay for spares and, and equipment that arrived. Um, clandestinely, I guess, through things like tobacco crates, etc., um, to avoid the sanctions that had been imposed on Rhodesia at that time. A lot of that, that stuff um, was just basically weapon spares. You know, the bigger capital purchases were done directly from army headquarters. And I would guess that um, 
the larger accounts would have been paid through Ministry of Defence and not through our particular office because of the sensitivity of what they were of what they were buying. Um, at the time that I was appointed as the accountant for Defence Procurement Fund, um, before I could even take up the position and get stuck into it, um, independence came in April 1980, as you know. We were at, um, I forget the name of the office, actually. It was in, it was in Resendia Street, opposite the bus terminus. That's all I know. Yeah. In Salisbury, by the main post office on uh, Julius Nereri, which was Kingsway. You didn't want to leave it after dark in that area, huh? That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, we were upstairs then when, when um, the celebrations came for independence. And, um, you know, a lot of the guys were in the streets running around with cocks above their head, jongwees. You know, screaming John Wee, John Wee was a very, yeah. very, for us, coming from where we came from, yeah. it was a really intimidating sight. Very intimidating. I was in, the, intimidating. I was in the thick of it at, at the um, at the stadium. I was Mrs. Gandhi's um, liaison officer between her guys and the, and the Rhodesian forces. So I was right in there in the stadium watching the whole thing happen. Yeah, wow. it was intimidating even for us, even though we were armed. It was not nice at all. No, absolutely not. So... Yeah, that that's then. Um, yeah, and I and I can remember clearly. I got a call from Tony Thornton. Tony Thornton was one of the assistant secretaries of the Ministry of Defence, and um, she was my direct boss, by the way. Um, she phoned me and she said, "Ian, for goodness' sakes, start shredding everything you got. All top secret, secret stuff to shred it." And uh, we spent the time just shredding documents left, right, and centre, um, because we didn't know what was going to happen thereafter. You know, oh, so it was quite... what a pity. There must have been some stuff that it. Would have gone down in history if you were able to keep it, hey? No, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and then I was called up to Ministry of Defence, and um, you know, just given an appraisal of what the story was and where we should go from there, you know. And so, um, yeah, it was quite a, it was quite a quite a period of time. It was just quite a, a sensitive time in our history, basically, you know. But anyway, putting that aside, when Basil left, um, and when I took over as senior accountant, before then and during then, we liaised. A lot with um, with army headquarters and air force headquarters, um, because we control their budgets, and um, we attended all their, their sort of finance meetings as well. Um, so there was a lot of liaison between ourselves and um, and army headquarters. Um, but bear in mind then that the senior accountant and ministry of defence were responsible for the appropriation accounts of all the forces, the army, the air force, the guard force. And the SFAs, and if you remember the SFAs, the Security Force Auxiliaries. Um, so yeah, and so we had we had quite a quite a big portfolio to look after. During the course of our our um, our work that we did and our liaison between Air Force and, and and Army, mainly Army headquarters, I was dealing with the um, a senior officer there by the name of Mark Pillen. Mark Pillen was a brigadier. Mark Pillen was brigadier finance at the time. He'd been made up to brigadier. He was um, commander of Rhodesian engineers for uh, many years, I think about eight years. And um, he was a well-respected, well-liked officer, very, very clever guy. I don't know if you've ever came across him at all or not. No, I didn't know. No. So Mike Pelham was appointed brigadier finance. Um, and remember also, I think you, if, if you can if you can recall at that time, uh, BMAT had come into the country. Yes. The British military advisory and training team mm. had come to the country and they were overseeing the integration of the three forces. That is the Rhodesian forces, Zonland and Zipra mm. at that time. So everybody was going into, well, these guys were going into um, assembly points and, and things like that, which was nothing really to do with me. We only, um, the only time we got involved was that uh, we had to provide the finance for all the rations and it went into the hundreds of millions. Of, of dollars. It was unbelievable how much they were spending on rations. And I, that's just one thing I remember at that time. Good Lord. Mm. Yeah. So, and there was a, <laughs> there was a guy by the name of Glinchy. He was a racehorse owner. He had the contract to supply rations to the assembly points. Mm. And he became an extremely rich man. I don't know whether he's still around or not, um, but um he used to come into our office pleading poverty saying, can you sign off this, uh, you know, this check and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I bet that was very, very profitable because they had, what, upwards of fifteen to 20,000 people in the camps at that point? I'm not too sure the numbers, Tony, but um, the amounts of money that was being expended on rations, especially rations, mm. assembly points were staggering. 
That's all I can remember. And I, mm. you know, and I was reluctant just to sign up unless somebody at the Ministry of Defence Council signed it, which was normally the case anyway. So yeah, I remember. You know, you know, we're going back 35, 40 years. You know, I can mm. I can remember some things quite vividly and others not. Mm. Um, and it's not a selective uh, memory type thing. It was just to do with age, I guess. You know. Yeah. So yeah, so Mike Pillen was Brigadier Finance, um, and it, as I said at that time, um, I was saying to you that um, with the three armies being integrated into one Zimbabwe National Army, um, there was a lot of jockeying for people to get certain positions within the military. So you had um, a lot of people who were ex-combatants who weren't entirely qualified to be in positions that were, they were in, but they had to be put there for political reasons. Mm. The Rhodesian, the ex-Rhodesian army officers normally took second um, second seat behind the ex-combatants. Mike Pelham was appointed Brigadier Finance, and um, he obviously answered directly to Rex Nunga, the commander. Mark Pelham was an extremely brilliant guy, brilliant mind. He really was. And he actually, I, I worked a lot with him. And he eventually said to me, I'm going to need somebody in Finance Branch to run, you know, to run Finance Branch. Um, would you consider coming over? And my reaction was no, not at all. I didn't really, you know, at that stage, I had plans to, to move to, to South Africa. And I didn't really want to get involved, to be honest with you. The guy that was Mark Pelham's deputy, was a guy by the name of Shopasi, which was his Chimaringa name. It wasn't his born name, it was his Chimaringa name. Um, he was an ex-combatant as well, and he was a full colonel. And uh, he um, he was appointed colonel finance. So if I took up this position as chief accountant, I would be um, accountable to him and ultimately accountable to Mark Pelham. Long story cut short, eventually they convinced me, that, look, we'll give you a, you know, a five-year contract or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, there were a lot of other things involved as well. Mike but Pelham needed uh, somebody to run finance branch um, because he, his portfolio was finance branch, pay corp, and also ADPU. ADPU was the Army Data Processing Unit, which was the computer bureau of um, at, at Army headquarters. And that was run by and owned by John Tully. Well, the, the equipment, sorry, the computer, it was a big computer, it was the size of the room in those days, you know. So, yeah. And now you'd, you'd get a laptop, I mean, or not even a laptop or phone. <laughs> exactly. So Mark, Mark Bellum had those three portfolios um, to look after, and he wanted someone to run a finance branch um, out of the three. So the, his deputy was a guy named Colonel Shopassi, as I mentioned before. Um, that was his Chimaringa, Chimaringa name. Um, his proper name was Godfrey Tambudza Matamachani. Um, he would have been, he will be, he would have been my my direct boss, or well, he was my direct boss. Um, but nine times out of ten, I went straight to Pelham, you know, um, because we were good friends in, in a way that was good and a way that wasn't. Um, how, so, did you, how did you feel when inside of yourself when you first looked into the eyes of these guys that were creeping into the offices and covered in, in red bread and all that sort of stuff? What was your reaction internally? Well, I think, you know... Were you, think, were you treated badly by them at all? Not at all. No. Not at all. I was treated extremely well. And I think that you've got to be you've got to be a realist. You've got to accept the inevitable. You've got to understand that this is the situation. And you either like it or you lump it, one of the two. Yeah. Um, so just just remember at that time, okay, there was that fusion or that integration of the three armies. Okay, so inevitably, inevitably, there would have been some tension somewhere on the line. Yeah. Okay, but I didn't find that. In Army headquarters, there was an aura of, let's get on with it, guys. We've got a job to do. Um, it was quite a vibrant um, 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 atmosphere because everybody was busy doing what they needed to do. BMAT were there, you know, as well. Um, it was fairly new, if you want to call it that, a new scenario. Um, it was now open house now. It wasn't a closed house with sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. So I found it um, quite interesting, if I can put it to you that way. And was was BMAT biased towards you? Because, you know, I'm asking about bias from the Zimbabwean commanders, but what about them? You know, um, with all due respect to the POMs, uh, many of whom I love and many of whom I don't, they can also be pretty two-faced. Did you find that was the problem with BMAT? I got them very well with BMAT. Mm. I really did. You know, I think they were, I think they were being realistic and knowing that they can get more joy Mm. Um, 
you know, out of uh, the former Rhodesian Army guys who are well qualified and experienced, as you know. Yeah. Um, but in all all fairness to the ex combatant guys that came in from Zon and Zipra, um, they just tried their level best and they they were guided by BMAT. BMAT arranged courses. They actually formed a um, a college called the Zimbabwe Star College um, that was actually staffed in the main initially by BMAT, by British instructors. Um, so they were heading in the right direction. And, um, you know, Zimbabwe is now an open house and it was now legal. We're going to call it that. You know, you and I can debate until the cows come home, the pros and cons about it, what mm. you like, what I like, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But that wasn't, that wasn't my, my brief. That wasn't my portfolio. You know, my brief was to get on with the business of, of running finance branch. Um, or running the, the 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 budget for the army, so um, Mark Pelham said to me, um, "Come and join us." And initially, I said no, and we overcame that by he said, "Look, I can offer you, you know, obviously a commission, um, you know, because my my equivalent rank in the public service equated to at least a third year captain in the uniform services, so I w- I wasn't prepared to come over to, to uniform unless it was on the basis of at least a first year major. Mm. So that was my bargaining chip in the beginning." Mm. And tell him, say, look, come in as a as an officer anyway, and um, you know I will put you up to first year major over a period of time. So that's what actually happened. So I went back in uniform. Every single person that came from those three armies had to go to officer status and not to rank. Now that's a difficult one to understand, but everybody who came in who was going to enter position had a green board officer epaulet as opposed to a green board with insignia on. Oh. That was opposite status. Mm. And only after a period of time would you go to your displayed rank. Right. So I came in basically as a green board officer, and then I was put up to first year major um, over a period of time. Mm. So anyway, so I took up my appointment. Um, I took over the running of the, the budget for the Army, the appropriation account for the Army, uh, and everything that entailed um, the budgetary side and, and the you know, everything, the allocation with the different corps and services in the army. At army headquarters, you may know that all the um, all the corps and the and the branches were represented there. So it was AQ, uh, G branch, uh, services directorate, uh, um, medical corps, signals directorate. You know, everything was at army headquarters. Did you oversee procurement of of equipment and stuff? Because that must no. be hard to budget for, really. No, that that was that was a combination between services directorate and, and G branch. Mm-hmm. G, G branch, as far as I understood it, would formulate the requirements, and then service directorate, would, services directorate would undertake the tender procedures. Right. Okay. Finance branch. Okay, would oversee the financial commitment. I want you. And nine times out of ten, what they wanted, they didn't have in terms of finance. So it was a real jug, you know, trying to juggle figures around and. You know, remember one thing that the senior officers at Army Headquarters at that time, i.e. Rex Longo, uh, Vitalis Zinavashi, uh, Dominic Chuenga, um, people like that, they didn't care where the money came from or, or, or whatever. They wanted the money to buy what they needed. Yeah. So there was a lot of pressure from that side. And I, as a fairly junior officer in relation to Mike Pelham, mm. Okay, I didn't really get involved in things like that, you know, in 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 the allocation of finance for that. It would have to be done at brigadier level. And was were any of the funds externally sourced, or was it all from the the Zimbabwean taxpayer? No, it was all from the appropriation account within Zimbabwe. Mm. Um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of a lot of funding would have come from outside the country, uh, maybe from UK. I don't know. Mm. Um, but I only dealt with the local currency only. Mm. Then, yeah. And any interesting characters that you met in that role, people of uh, of note that we've spoken about on other programs at all? Um, if I can re- just quickly um, recollect, um, they combined the A and Q function at Army Headquarters. So um, the general in charge of AQ was uh, General Maseka, I think it was, Major General Maseka. Um, he was an ex-Zipper officer. Um, G branch was um, overseen by uh, Major General Vitalis Zivanavashi. His Chimaringa name was Shiba Gava. Um, he was a big mad up in Shiri. They were definitely in the same mold. I'll mm. leave it there. Um, yeah, so that, those were the main characters at that stage. Rex Nongo, of course. Uh, Solomon Tambudza Mujuru was his born name. Um, he was the Suprema, without a doubt, you know. Mm. And of course, you had the political figures in the background, the ministers like um, Emerson Mwanangwagwa and Sidney Sekaramai and, and people like that. 
Um, but they didn't really get involved in in the military side as far as I know. Rex Nongo was the guy that that wielded the big stick there, without a doubt. The director of, of um, services corps, uh, sorry, the services directorate um, was um, Brigadier Chamombi. Um, a very likable guy as well. Um, obviously an ex-combatant, an excellent design the combatant. Um, and, you know, a lot of people came in and out. of. They were transferred in, transferred out. There was Brigadier Chanyuka. Um, he was Brigadier G at one stage. There was Brigadier, um, he was ex Um There was Brigadier Charles Gray. Um, very nice guy. Short little, if I may use the word, person of colour <laughs> um, from Cape Town, I think. Yeah. Um, he was there. He sadly died. Um, some years back, but he was, um, and and he, he struggled a bit because he was the wrong faction. So even though he was Brigadier G, how he got there, I don't know, but he was pretty well limited in what he could uh, authorize. Um, and then you had the Rhodesian officers that were there. So Colonel G at that stage was John Pritchard. Um, Colonel A was uh, John Templer, uh, Flap Templer. Um, Deputy Director of Services Corps was uh, John Rogers, Colonel Rogers. Um, I think his nickname was Buck, Buck Rogers. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then you had Services Corps, um, Shinga Dubi, who was uh, an ex-Zipra officer, was the director of Sign Signals Corps. I don't know why. He was well liked by the Zonla guys, for whatever reason it was. Um, very likable guy as well. His deputy was a, a former Rhodesian Army officer guy by the name of um, Colin Mann, Lieutenant Colonel Mann. Um, the engineering engineering corps was run by um, an ex honor combatant by the name of Colonel Gordon Malumbo. Um, Gordon Malumbo was an absolute alcoholic, unfortunately, and he killed himself in a car crash pretty okay. early on in, in the early 80s. Um, his deputy was a former Rhodesian officer by the name of uh, Andrew Rosevear, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rosevear. Um, DMI was um, Colonel Mutchemwai, who went on to become Minister of Health, actually. Also a very nice guy. Um, so you had all these different characters um, and, and personalities at Army Headquarters. And it's, like I said, it was quite a, a vibrant uh, atmosphere. You know, we just got on with the job of of, of doing the job, basically running the, the sort of military and whatever. Did you start, was... start to suspect corruption of any type creeping in at any point? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I, I, I can tell you now there was... Um, the CO in charge of armored cars at that stage. Mm. I met him um, in the library at Army headquarters. And, you know, we just bumped into one another, introduced ourselves. He was a half colonel, so I was I, and I said to him, you know, how's it going fine? He said, you know, I've just been posted out of armored cars. I said, why? Didn't agree with the hierarchy. Why? You know, at that stage, I think armored cars had Panars and Elans and, uh, yeah. and, and those sort of uh, vehicles. But yeah. um, he got an order to purchase uh, 55 Cascaval armored cars from Brazil mm -hmm. at a cost of 66 million US dollars. In that stage, it was quite a lot of quite a lot of money, actually. A lot of back scratching there, by the sound of it. And I think there was a bit of back scratching there to the tune of about six or seven million. So um, I don't want to speculate there, but it's only speculation anyway. But rumors were ripe, and you know, I suppose where the smoke is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a, that... he was a white guy in charge of armored cars, wasn't he? I think. Um... Didn't they, <clears throat> wasn't he involved in that battle of Entenbani and Bulaway? Um, the CEO at that time was Bruce Rickensmith. Mm. Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Rickensmith. And he he actually, he was posted out there because he objected to um, these vehicles coming in without being user trialed. Right. You know, so um, that's what he told me anyway. And I'm just basically quoting a conversation that we had. Mm. Um, yeah. He had a young young guy in, in Armored Cars by the name of Hamish McIntosh, who eventually I got into finance branch, and he became one of our captains. Let's squash with him a lot. Okay. Now, all this, <clears throat> excuse me, was all going on when 5th Brigade was um, doing its nasty bit down in Matabele land. Um, did that have um, any type of um, impact on the Shona and the Indabele working in your office? Did it cause friction, you know? My interbelly mates are being culled in Matabili land and I've got to rub shoulders with you type of thing. If it was, it wasn't evident. Mm. But I think that every like I said earlier, everybody had to get on with everybody else. You know, what happened in the in 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 the sort of operational areas and whatever and how people felt towards one another. I think those feelings had to take a back a backstage. Yeah. And people just got on with it. There was definitely friction between um ex and ex officers, without a doubt. And ex 
Rhodesian Army officers as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one day you are in um, in total control, and the next day you're rubbing shoulders with the enemy, mm -hmm. perceived enemy at that stage. Mm -hmm. But I think, as you quite rightly pointed out, uh, Tony, after 1980, it became Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwe National Army was formed from the three previously warring factions. You have to accept the inevitable, otherwise you're not going to progress. And mm -hmm. I think to a large extent that is actually what happened. Excuse me, what happened. Mm -hmm. When Fifth Brigade was uh, formed, um, as you know, it was commanded by Perrin Shiri. And he he reported directly to Rex Longo. Um, Perrin Shiri, I met every single one of those guys. I met him in, in Harare. I met him in London on a trip that I did to London as well when he was doing his training with the Brits. Um, but I think his main training came from North Korea. Mm. And how did he treat you? At Army headquarters, it was <laughs> diplomatically hostile, I want to put it that way. Um, the same as um, Shiba Garver, General, General Garver. He was, he was diplomatically hostile. Um, him and Perrin Shi got him very well, and they were very, very similar characters. When I informally um, had a bear with Perrin Shiri in London at the Zimbabwe High Commission when he was still doing his training there, he was exceptionally friendly. You know, that sort of coat of arm, in fact, had fallen by the wayside a bit, and we talked, and we talked mm -hmm. openly, you know. Um, so, yeah, but I think. The hostility was, will always be there. It was there, and it, and it was a reality. There was no getting away from it. So the diplomatic sort of hosp hosp hostility was um, just letting you know that that we were runners up, and um, just take it or leave it. Yeah, I think it was an attitude of you're lucky to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll tolerate you because you've got the experience, you've got the qualifications. We need you for now, mm -hmm. but as time goes on, maybe not. You know. And, and that must have been playing in the back of your mind all the time that you were basically being used for a period of time that didn't give you any sort of certainty as to career terms or anything like that. I think it'd be realistic, Tony. You know, if you look at if you look at Signal School, it was mm -hmm. run by Shingadubi, Paul Colonel, etc. His deputy was Colin Mann, who did all the work. Mm -hmm. Colin Mann. Mm -hmm. Finance branch was run when when Mark Pillam left. Um, it was run by Colonel Shopasi. Okay. He didn't have the qualifications. He didn't have the experience. Mm. So he did all the work. Mm. Me. Mm. <laughs> and mm. so it happened in, in, in a lot of different units like that. Um, I don't I don't harbor any regrets about that at all. I just think it, to be realistic, it was what it was. And you, either you accepted it or you're in the wrong job. We shouldn't mm. be there, you know. And I, I was lucky that I was able to accept it. In in many respects, it, it was a miracle that it went as well as it did, it could have been a lot worse. There could have been mass reprisals, um, people being locked up, businesses folded. Um, it was actually not too bad at the end of the day. Yeah, we got through it at the end of the day. I mean, there were, were instances where there were, um, you know, uh, take for example, when, they, when the uh, aircraft and, and query were, mm. were self-launched. That was a very difficult period as well. And later on with the farmers, that, that was a terrible period, very worrying for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah, you left by that point, I guess, haven't you? Yeah, you know, for the first, in my own opinion, for the first sort of 20 years, if you want to call it that, 15 years, 20 years after independence, mm. it wasn't bad. Mm. It wasn't bad. I met I met uh, President Mugabe many, many times at, in different functions in different places as part of my sort of military duties with the other senior officers as well. Mm. Um. No hostility, you know, no hostility. And politicians are different, of course. Yeah, um, I, I, but... rub, I rubbed shoulders with all of them, Mugabe, Carrington, um, Indira Gandhi, because I was in all the meetings. I sat a few feet away from them all the time. And, um, you yeah, obviously they were the victors and they were rejoicing. But there wasn't any, I didn't see any hostility in the eyes of any of them when they looked at me. It was just, you know, this is the beginning of a new era. Yeah. I think that's exactly what it was. Um, where I think things changed, of course, was when the, the bonds were taken. Mm. Uh, and, of course, everything went downhill after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, th I think <laughs> it's a terrible thing. Eh? You know, we can talk about that until the cows come out. I think, I think, I, I'm, maybe some viewers will disagree with me, but I think at some point Mugabe realised he'd overshot the whole thing. 
but it was too late. The damage had been done and it was irreversible, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yeah. So any other interesting highlights from your time um, there in, in the Zimbabwean army? Yeah, look, Tony, there were many, many, many different uh, um, um, stories that I could probably relate to. And I can't remember all of them. We're going back now 35 years, you know, 35 mm -hmm. years. Uh, Mark Pelham eventually left um, to take an appointment with uh, John Breedenkamp. Mm -hmm. um, John Breedenkamp owned Castle Cargo, as you probably know, mm -hmm. uh, Tobacco. Um, yeah, he took him to appointment there. So he, he was relocated to Belgium. That's where he operated from. Um, and I, I, he actually asked me to join him as well, which I, at that stage, maybe I should have. Mm. Um, didn't want to, and I just left it at that. Um, and then Show Pussy became Brigadier Finance. Um, I acted as full colonel on many occasions, but I never got that rank of full colonel. I just wasn't the right, the right side of the fence, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you know, flavor, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's that's um, you know, some of the stories I can relate to, but there are many, many more. We just don't have time to sit down and talk, to, you know, talk about them all. Did you, uh, I don't know if it's pertinent to mention this now. We can always get it edited out. But you had some chats with the English and the Americans? Well, I I, I had very close contacts with them. You know, mm. um, I played golf with both of them. Um, the British military attaché and uh, the American military attaché. Mm. Mm. Um, and it, it, was just a, it was just a normal thing. I mean, I had close contacts with the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. That close contacts with the Chinese, you know, it it was just just one of those things, you know. We like, we were quite lucky in that being a senior accountant at Army headquarters, you were required to attend a lot of the diplomatic functions, and I was quite happy to to attend those as well. So you you know you for the first time for the first time I was exposed now to international, um, you know, get-togethers with people that uh, you wouldn't have thought you would have socialized with at all. You know, um, first time I tasted, I, I've drunk Mao Tai. I don't know who you have, but no. <laughs> it is exceptionally strong. But both the the Chinese and the North Koreans drink a lot of it. So, uh, and and yeah. were they accommodating and friendly people? Very, hmm. very. They're very accommodating. There wasn't that animosity that you get um, when people start talking politics. I suppose, uh, I suppose at their level, it's all just a game. They haven't seen the blood in the guts and all that sort of stuff. Um, so they, they can be as, as amicable as they like. Uh, yeah. 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 I think you're quite right. You know, they, you know, when you get together socially mm. and you're standing there and you're eating and you're drinking and you're drinking more Mao Tai and more Mao Tai or whatever the case may be, mm. you don't have that, um, that hostility. You don't start thinking about things and, you know, outside mm. of that, of that room, you know, it's, um, so yeah, it was a very interesting period for me. It really was. What year did you finally leave? I think I left in 1988. Wow. Um, some years after I um, I thought I would leave, to be honest with you. Um, but no regrets. I think when I left, it was definitely the time to leave. Without you, must a doubt. Been, you must have been the last radio left in the, in the forces? Uh, yeah, I would think so. I can't think of anybody at this stage um, mm. who was left other than myself. Yeah. So from... From your point of view, which was the best experience in your life, being a, a, a corporal in an ambush in Mozambique or being a colonel in the Zim Army? Difficult question to answer that. Very, very difficult question to answer that. I won't ever regret my, my trippy days, ever. It was an experience. It was a, a time when we were all young, when we were energetic, and when, mm. we, were, when we were eager, very keen to get into the fight, mm. not worried about what the consequences we've got in the fight first, and worry about the consequences later but as you as you get older and you get more mature um it was an eye opener i had the benefit of seeing both sides of the of the story not just one side um and the darker side that we always knew was there prior to 1980 is not as dark as we thought it was yeah i think there was a little bit of propaganda to keep us fighting but i agree with you we had a wonderful little army and the guys were fantastic they were they were ready to fight they loved their lands uh, nobody was coerced I don't know if anybody that went to jail for not fighting. Um, it, it it was a brilliant... And the supply and resupply systems were brilliant. We never went without fuel. And I, it, it was um, the logistics. I'm longing to interview somebody who was heavily involved in logistics. I've said this time after time in my interviews because that's something that's always fascinated me. 
How did the Germans keep 11 million men fed and watered in the field? Um, I'd like to know how it happened in the Rhodesian army. Um, yeah, so, well, it's been a very interesting talk, and um, we're running out of time on this second uh, section already. So we've got maybe five minutes left if there's anything you'd like to say in closing, um, Ian. Um, no, I, I just I would like to say that, um, you know, just I really enjoyed my time. Mm. I really did. It was a... Um, it was a good period of my life that I will always cherish. I think that the experiences, the friends made, I mean, it wasn't all roses, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, there were a lot of tense moments as well. Um, yeah, maybe at another stage I could probably elaborate on that. But um, overall, it was a, it was an experience that I think that held me in good stead. Mm. I was able to travel a lot internationally. Um, I'll tell you one quick story before we go. Okay. Um I was called into the office of um, of the commander, Rex Nongo, and he did this quite frequently. And he said to me, Ian, I want you to go quickly, fly up to Cairo. I said, okay, what must I do? He said, we've got um, um, cadets there training on um, on tanks or something like that. He said, you need to go up and pay them. I said, okay, well, how do I do that? Though? Where must I get the money from? He said, go to the Reserve Bank now, spoken to the governor. He will give you 50,000 US dollars. I said, okay. So I went down to the Reserve Bank. I picked up a uh, um, fifty thousand US dollars in cash. I bundled them into a briefcase and I flew up to Cairo. But I can't fly on my own because of those days. It was one Rhodesian Army officer, well, one ex Rhodesian, and one uh, ex uh, combatant. So I went up to I flew up to Cairo with a guy by the name of David Chueza, um, Lieutenant Colonel, and he became the um, the military attaché to Washington. In later years, I'm talking about. Him and I flew up there. It was the first time he had flown on the airplane. And uh, at some point, he said, do we get out now? And he wanted to open the door. And I said, no, no, no. Sit down, sit down. You know? We landed in Cairo, went to, picked up for the military because it was a military governor in those days. Long story cut short. They took us to the cadets. We sat down, spoke to them, found they'd been paid already. So we came back with all the money. <laughs> we spent two weeks in Cairo, sightseeing. At the at the thing, my, the highlight was going into the museum, which was locked. And we saw Tutankhamun's um, gold masks and his uh, funerary and his and everything that he had, the original stuff, not uh, the replicas. And we were the only ones in that museum. Wow. And I flew back. When he flew back, I went into to Rex Nonga and he said, what happened? So I told him. And he said, what happened to the money? I said, yeah, does you And he was absolutely shocked. He said, you came back with it. I said, yeah. So I said, I'm on my way back to the Reserve Bank to give it back to them as well. When I told my father, he said, you're mad. Did you come? You came back. <laughs> that's a true story <laughs> well Ian on that yeah. note thank you very much for a very interesting and enlightening talk and um, yeah if we think of more things that you'd like to say I'm sure we could have a part two um, but for now I'd like to thank you very much for coming on board and um, before we end I'd like to do my usual little appeal to everybody to please come forward and give us your story uh, we're all getting older we're dying off um, but not only that, uh, we need your story for posterity and to keep the record straight. There have been so many biased records written about us that um, this is very, very important work. So please do come forward. You can contact me, Tony Ballinger, on Facebook, and um, I'll set the whole thing up for you. So, Ian, thanks very much, my friend, and all the very best to you. Thank you, Tony. Take care. Cheers, Cheers bye. Bye-bye.